Hi everyone, it's me again. In this lecture, I will talk about transforming the global geocentric coordinates into the official coordinates of the state. So let's begin. Uh, this lecture will be separated on five chapters and we will start from a short, short discussion about the global coordinate systems. Um, so we can say that the con conventional terrestrial reference system is defined by a set of conventions, algorithms and constants which provide the origin, scale, and orientation of that system and its evolution in time. It is a global geocentric coordinate system used to describe the position on Earth. So um, this reference system is also known as a Earth-centered or Earth-fixed uh, coordinate system, where the Earth-fixed part actually means that it is rotating in space together with our planet, unlike, for example, celestial reference systems. In such a system, a position of a point attached to a solid surface of the Earth has the coordinates which undergo small variations over time due to geophysical effects such as tectonics or tidal deformations. In its origin, uh, its origin is in the center of the Earth masses. Its uh, prin principal x-axis is pointing uh, toward intersect of the Greenwich Meridian and the equator. Uh, the z-axis uh, coincides with the Earth's rotational axis defined by the conventional terrestrial pole, which is defined by the average Earth pole position between years uh, 1900 and 1905. And finally, the y-axis just completes the right-handed coordinate system. As I said, the coordinate systems are basically a set of rules and conventions, so they do not exist in physical reality. For example, axes and origins are not physically accessible and they, they can change over time. To overcome this problem, we use reference frames, which are basically the realization of the reference systems in reality. The reference frames are realized or defined by set of physical points with the precisely, precisely determined coordinates in specific coordinate system. So we can say that the reference frames help us to fix coordinate system in space. One of the most widely used global coordinate systems is ITRS, uh, International Terrestrial, Terrestrial Reference System, while the realization of it is ITRF or International Terrestrial Reference Frame. New ITRF solutions are produced every few years using the latest mathematical and geodetic techniques and sensor systems such as, for example, VLBI, Satellite Laser Ranging, GNSS and DORIS system. And on this figure, you can see the distribution of all measurement stations that were used to compute the newest uh, version of ITRF from 2014. And each new realization actually attempts to realize uh, ITRS as precise as possible, so slightly more precise than the previous realizations. So, because of the Earth's tectonic plates that continuously move with the speed of approximately 2 cm per year, besides uh, knowing the exact 3D coordinates of all measured stations or points that I previously showed, we also need to uh, estimate the velocity and the direction of these points' movement over time. And these values are also a part of the terrestrial reference frame definition. There are more definitions and realizations of the conventional terrestrial reference systems and frames, and uh, I will show you here a few examples. So the ITRF, as I already mentioned, is calculated every few years and it is ma maintained by the scientific community. And uh, as I said, the current version is from 2014 with a positional accuracy of some 5 to 15 millimeters. Uh, for the position of the points and 2 to 3 millimeters um, per year for the velocity of the points. And the goal of the next ITRF realization is actually to achieve the accuracy of around 1 millimeter for the position of each uh, point or station used for the measurements. Um, the ITRS, Inter uh, European Terrestrial Reference System from 89, um, could be described as the frozen realization of ITRF from the year 89, and such frozen realizations are typically used for the derivation of the official coordinates, and uh, the ITRS is used for the definition of the or official coordinates in Germany, for example. And the reason for 
this is that it would it would be highly impractical if these coordinates of all Mac objects and land, land parcels that are in the government uh, databases uh, need to be changed every year because of the plate tectonics. That's the reason why we need this frozen solution for government purposes. And the third example that I have here on this side is the World Geodetic uh, System 84, uh, which is developed by US Department of Defense and originally as a military system. And besides the realization of the reference system, it also specifies the reference ellipsoid and uh, some fundamental constants in the gravity model. It is an adapted uh, to ITRF and the difference between these two systems are in some order of decimeters. As you are probably known from the previous lectures, the GPS satellite orbits and the coordinates that we users receive are defined within this system. And this is what I just said. Um, the transformation between different global coordinate systems are again just uh, 3D similarity transformations as we had in the previous lecture and uh, where the most of the applications, uh, for the most of the applications the, the number of degrees of freedom can be reduced to just three because the rotations are approximately zero and there is no difference in the scale between different coordinate systems so they can be ignored. Although global 3D Cartesian coordinates are practical for some applications, for example, for determination of the satellite orbits, as we previously mentioned, and for estimating the position of GNSS receivers, they are not very practical for describing the position with respect to the Earth's surface. And um, therefore, they are often transformed into ellipsoidal or geodetic coordinates, which are defined with the longitude lambda, latitude phi and uh, ellipsoid height with, uh, defined with age, uh, which describes the height of the point above the surface of the ellipsoid. The ellipsoid coordinates require the definition of the reference ellipsoid, which is just a simple approximation of the Earth shape, and uh, there are several reference er ellipsoids that are currently being used. Uh, for example, uh, we have currently be used GRS 80, WGS 84, and in history in the Europe, uh, Bessel was one of the used ellipsoids. A conversion of ellipsoid coordinates to Cartesian counterparts uh, is given by these equations, where the n represents the tra transverse radius of ellipsoid's curvature, which is just a function of ellipsoid parameters and the latitude phi. A reverse transformation from Cartesian to polar coordinates is more difficult. So theoretically, there is a direct solution for this system of equations. However, it is very complicated and therefore it is practically never used in practice. In practice, the solution is retrieved, uh, retrieved by iteratively solving the equations given on this slide, where approximate latitude, uh, phi, needs to be previously known and iteratively updated or refined. So a reference ellipsoid is a mathematical approximation of the Earth's shape and size, and it can be considered as a trade-off or the most practical solution falling between the approximation of the Earth with the sphere, for which we know it is too inaccurate for most applications because Earth and all the planets are flattened on the poles due to the centrifugal forces. And, um, but it is much more simple, for example, than geoid, which is a more accurate representation of the Earth's surface, but it significantly complicates the numer numerical computations, which is un unnecessary for many applications. But we will come back to geoid a little bit later. Anyway, I know that you learn uh, a lot about the reference ellipsoids from Professor Kusche, so just to make it short, uh, because in the case of the Earth's approximation, we are talking about the ellipsoid of revolution or spheroid. It is uniquely defined just with two parameters, the length of the semi-major and semi-minor axis. And these parameters can be used to rec recalculate some of the auxiliary par parameters, such as flattening and eccentricity. Also, as I mentioned, there are several realizations of the reference ellipsoids, where some are actively used, like WGS84, which is used in US, 
uh, for GPS navigation, uh, GRS-80, which is used globally and also often in Europe, and for example, uh, Russian Parametri Zemli, uh, which is used for the GLONASS navigation. While, as I also said, bezel is a historical uh, ellipsoid that was used in Europe. To summarize, each global coordinate is related to one of the reference systems and eventually a reference surface where, for example, GPS coordinates are calculated and given as 3D Cartesian coordinates in WGS84 system without consider considering any reference surface. However, they are often transformed in ellipsoidal coordinates for better interpretation on the Earth surface. Uh, now I will quickly present you a few reasons why for many applications such coordinates are not sufficient and why we need official coordinates which are related to cartographic projection and split from 3D into 2D plus 1D. So many applications actually require that the position of the object are defined on the Earth's surface in easily interpretable and measurable metric units. And this is not uh, fulfilled neither with the 3D global Cartesian coordinates, which are metric, but, are, but they are somehow hanging em in empty space and have no connection to the Earth's surface, nor this is uh, done with the ellipsoidal coordinates that are given in angular values, which are highly impractical to work with on a smaller scale. Uh, while these previous coordinates are better, for example, for the navigation tasks, the official coordinates that are related to cartographic projections are much more co convenient, for example, for CADASTA, uh, which, task, uh, which tracks the situation of all real estates and properties in a country. And um, as for the purpose of taxes, for example, or for the purpose of selling a piece of land or a house, we typically only need to know a surface area in square meters. Cadaster most often requires just a 2D information. However, there is now a slow trend that we are moving with the cadaster from 2D to 3D. So the last thing that I forgot to mention is that the 3D global Cartesian coordinates of each point on Earth change every year due to the plate tectonics. And this would be highly impractical again if the official maps and cadastral plans would need to be continuously updated because of this. So this is why the official coordinates are stable and permanently fixed in space and time. Another important use case for metric and permanently stable official coordinates are Geographic Information Systems or GIS, which gather, manage and analyze a variety of spatially and geographically related data. The number of use cases is practically unlimited, spawning through spheres of science, government, business and industry. And um, a frequent use case, which can be which is depicted on this slide, is the analysis of the 3D maps in order to estimate the, the terrain slopes and for the purposes of uh, hydrological modeling or modeling how the water flows and watersheds. In these cases, besides the 2D position, we also need the information of the height with respect to the Earth's surface and not to the surface of some imaginary ellipsoid. Uh, also, the ur urban planning has very similar requirements where it is highly important that the heights are physically interpretable and given correctly considering the Earth's surface because uh, of the construction of sewage and drainage systems. And finally, uh, the same goes for the civil engineering projects, such as, uh, for example, the project of subway tunnel in the city of Nuremberg in Germany, which is depicted on this slide. So to summarize, official coordinates need to be separated in a 2D position and 1D height. They need to be metric and stable over time, while the height needs to be physically interpretable considering the Earth's surface or ground. So let me say something about the 2D positional coordinates. So you are all familiar with the problem of cartographic projections. The Earth is, well, approximately round, while the map needs to be planar. So we need to introduce some distortions to manage this. And by selecting the cartographic projections or practically the set of mathematical equations, we can choose among different possibilities how this will going to happen. 
There are dozens of different cartographic projections, even some heart-shaped ones such as Werner projection. However, only three are most commonly used to make official maps, and those are azimuthal projection, conical projection, and cylindrical one. Azimuthal projections are most frequently used to map the polar regions. The conical projection, projections are frequently used, for example, in aviation, uh, although Lambert uh, conformal conic projections is also used for some op official maps in some countries, uh, where the most widespread are the cylindrical projections. Uh, cylindrical map projections are used to transform the 3D coordinates into rectangular planar coordinate system, where the Earth meridian and parallels are mapped as a straight parallel lines, uh, following the main coordinate system axis in the direction of the east and the north. So, uh, I know this is a bit of the repetition from what you will hear from Professor Haunert, or you already heard from him, so I will try to make it short and simple. The most widespread cylindrical projections are transversal mercator projections where the horizontal cylinder is fit to the earth so that the deformations due to the cartographic projections are minimal. A special subclass of these projections called Gauss-Krüge projections were used for official maps earlier in Europe, where the radius of the cylinder was adjusted so that it exactly touches the earth's surface over a semicircle defined by a selected central meridian. In this projection, the coordinates of the objects that were exactly on the meridian uh, had no deformation in scale, while when, they, while when we would move further away on this uh, tangent plane, the scale factor and deformation would grow fast. Uh, and uh, because it go, the deformation grew quite fast, a uh, new central meridian and a new map projection were made for every three degrees of the Earth's longitude. Uh, nowadays, the most common cartographic projection is universal uh, transversal mercator projection, where the radius of the cylinder is somewhat smaller, and uh, so that it intersects the surface of the Earth um, or the Earth ellipsoid in two circles. And this way, the deformation of the scale or the scale change due to the projections are better distributed over the larger surface, allowing maps to cover larger areas or larger regions than the original ones. And therefore, modern UTM projections cover uh, typically the regions of six degrees of the Earth's longitude, which is double the area of the maps uh, used in the Gauss-Krieger projections. So uh, this way the whole world is actually split in 60 zones of six degrees uh, with uh, 60 central meridians. Uh, so to somehow visualize this, here you can see a sketch of one random zone where a portion of the zone region is above the cylinder, cylinder surface and the portion is uh, below the cylinder surface in order to better distribu distribute this distortion due to a map projection. And finally, one more time in 2D, uh, so you can see how the scale factor changes over the whole zone. Uh, so scale factor is in the central meridian 0 0.9996 for UTM and uh, the further we go from the central meridian the uh, scale factor increases and at these points the scale factor is approximately one and on the zone limit it goes slightly over than one. And on this slide you can see how large are distortions when we are considering the uh, distance from the central meridian. And you can see that they are in the level of 40 millimeters when we are standing on the central uh, meridian and that they are decreasing up to the 180 kilometers distance. And then they started slightly increasing again, however, this time with the opposite sign. So to summarize all most important characteristics from UTM projection, as we said, one zone is six degrees wide uh, and the projection is isogonal, meaning that angles between the objects in reality and the map are preserved. The main axes are in the direction of north and east, so the distance from the central meridian is called easting, while the northing value is calculated from the real distance from the equator in meters. In order to avoid the calculation with the negative values, um, from the left side of the central meridian, all easting coordinates are given additional constant of 500,000 meters. Also, to avoid any confusion when considering different zones, easting coordinates is 
always has in front the number of the zone. Um, yeah, so you can he see it here. Uh, the scale factor uh, at the central meridian we already discussed, and the zone numbering is officially defined as you can see uh, here. And um, it is also important to mention that the UTM projection has a projection limit at the latitudes of plus minus 80 degrees towards south and north poles. Uh, this is why, as I already mentioned, for these regions we often use azimuthal projection. And on this slide you can see how the UTM zones are distributed over the world on this world map. So besides 60 zones, or these stripes that are 6 degrees wide, each having a unique number, uh, each zone is separated also on 20 latitude bands, where each band is 8 degrees high, starting from the letter C at the limit of the projection at 80 degrees south, and it moves until the field X on the north. So these are the zones covering, covering Europe. And while well, the whole of Germany is covered with the zones uh, 31, 32, and 33, centered around meridians 3, 9, and 15. Um, although the UTM is a global cartographic projection solution, it is not directly related to any of the previously mentioned reference frames or reference ellipsoids. So every country can select its own set and Germany uses the ETRS core, uh, reference system and reference ellipsoid is uh, GRS-80. So that was it considering the positional coordinates on the map and now we will talk about heights. I already explained that a variety of applications require physical heights. Physical heights are typically given with respect to some form of the mean sea level, which defines zero elevation or zero height. And on the global scale, this zero elevation is defined with geoid. The geoid is another approximation of the Earth's surface, which can be described as an irregularly shaped model of global mean sea level that is used to measure precise surface elevation. So why is geoid irregular? The main reason is Earth's topography. For example, mountains have more mass than valleys, and thus the pull of gravity is regionally stronger ne near the mountains. And all of these large and small variations in size, shape, and mass distribution of the Earth uh, cause slight variations in the acceleration of the gravity or the strength of the gravity pull. And uh, these variations determine the shape of the planet's liquid environment. If we would remove tides and currents from the oceans, the water level would settle on a smoothly undulated shape, rising where the gravity is high, sinking where the gravity is low. And the shape is described by geoid. This is the shape of the geoid. To summarize, geoid is equipotential surface of the gravity field with an irregular shape, while the ellipsoid is just an approximation of geoid for the simplicity of numerical calculations. The height difference between geoid and the ellipsoid is called geoid undulation, and it needs to be known in order to get physical heights out of the ellipsoid heights. The geodetic engineers or geodesists have invented the whole philosophy about different height systems and their relationships. So I'm presenting here a bit simplified version. What is important for you to remember is that geodetic or ellipsoid heights equals geoid undulation plus orthometric or physical height above geoid. In Germany, the official physical heights are slightly differently defined and um, they are all called normal heights and they are calculated with respect to the quasi-geoid which can be determined as the best approximation of the real geoid based on the available measurements. To summarize the situation in Germany, official 2D positional coordinates are defined for UTM projection with respect to the ITRS-89 and the reference ellipsoid GRS-80, while the heights are physical normal heights with respect to quasi-geoid, and the current quasi-geoid model in Germany is GCG 2016, which is also called German Combined Quasi-Geoid. Uh, what I haven't mentioned so far is the term geodetic datum. A geodetic datum can be explained as a set of parameters 
that fix the relation between a reference frame and the reference system. So here, the reference system is a set of conventions and constants. The reference frame is the realization of the system by defining some physical points in space on Earth and determining their coordinates within this defined reference system. And as I said, the geodetic datum is a set of parameters that define the relation. And uh, typically we need 10 parameters to define the relation between these, and these are dimensions of the reference ellipsoid, seven parameters of uh, transformation, and a height reference. Um, however, there is a lot of confusion about these terms, and in the literature you can read that the people are using them interchangeably, as all three are the same, so don't be confused, or don't think about it too much. Anyway, what I wanted to say is that the relationship between ITRF, which follows the Earth motion and changes due to the plate tectonics, and the official 2D positional coordinates is Germany, is defined by transformation parameters between ITRS 89 and ITRF. So we can say that ITRS is positional datum for Germany, while the German height datum or the surface of reference is GCG. And uh, now, after all this story, I will show how the coordinates estimated with GNSS and terrestrial laser scanners are transformed into official coordinates. So the GPS observations are 3D Cartesian coordinates, which are defined in WGS84 coordinate system. And in order to reach the official coordinates of the state, we need to uh, pass four steps which I'll summarize briefly here. So first we need to move uh, from one Earth-centered Earth fixed uh, coordinate system to another one which is uh, defined as a geodetic datum for position by, by the state. In the case of Germany, this is ITRS 89. And uh, afterwards, these new transformed Cartesian coordinates need to be in the step two transformed in ellipsoid coordinates which are given in the relation to the reference ellipsoid, which is in our case GRS 80. And uh, then we have the step three, when we are moving from uh, ellipsoid coordinates to 2D cartographic projection, which is defined as the official one in the state. And in German, this is UTM, Easting and Northing. And uh, in the final step, we are moving from ellipsoid heights to the official height system in uh, Germany, what we said is normal heights. Let's get a bit deeper, step by step, on the transformation of the GNSS observations. First, we can separate the absolute positioning and the relative positioning with GNSS. In absolute positioning, we are observing our absolute position as a single point in space defined with the 3D Cartesian coordinates in WGS system. And here, the transformation from WGS to any other reference system is typically automatically applied in the instrument according to our selection. So all geodetic GNSS receivers in Germany, for example, will automatically transform the estimates, uh, estimated position in the ITRS 89 system. When making relative observations of the baselines or coordinate differences between the fixed GNSS master station and the moving rover antenna, uh, the problem is solved that the master station coordinates are transformed to ITRS 89 and that the observed coordinate differences are just applied to the transformed coordinates of the master station. And this is possible because there is no rotation or a scale change of the baseline vectors or these coordinate changes as the transformation between these two coordinate system can be approximated with pure translation. So uh, scale change and the rotations can be neglected. Uh, the second step of transforming the 3D Cartesian to ellipsoid coordinates is resolved by the equations that I already showed you. And uh, here, the selection of the reference ellipsoid plays a role, where in the case of the Germany, the reference ellipsoid is GRS 80. Uh, the third step is cartographic projection of ellipsoid coordinates, only latitude and longitude, to the 2D position on the map defined by Easting and Northing. And uh, the set of equations necessary to resolve this transformation is quite complicated, as you can see on the slide. And luckily, we do not need to solve it manually. In the final fourth step, 
we are transforming heights from ellipsoid ones to the physical heights. And here, as I already said, the choice of the reference height surface plays an important role. And this can be some of the global geoid or quasi-geoid models where it is important, important to know the difference between the reference surface and the ellipsoid, which is also known as geoid undulation. These geoid undulations are defined globally using the mix of satellite observations from the dedicated missions uh, such as GOCHE and terrestrial observations. As you can see on this map, geoid undulations can reach more than 60 meters over some regions and uh, they can also reach more than 100 meters under the ellipsoid in, for example, this region close to India. In Germany, a quasi-geoid GCG is used as a reference surface for heights, as we already heard, and the quasi-geoid undulation is provided by the Federal Office of Cart Cartography and Geodesy with a kilometer level resolution and accuracy of the few centimeters. And the undulation in Germany is somewhere in the region between 35 and 50 meters. And here is the summary one more time. First, we have transition of geodetic datum between WGS and ITRS system, then the relation to the reference ellipsoid, then the projection, 2D projection to UTM coordinates, and finally transformation of heights from imaginary ellipsoid surface to physical height over the selected reference surface, which is in the case of Germany GCG. And our last example today builds upon the examples that we had in the previous lecture and it considers making uh, 3D models or building 3D models with terrestrial laser scanners. Uh, so you all remember terrestrial laser scanners, uh, they make measurements in their own uh, local instrument related coordinate systems and the measurement directly give us the polar coordinates in this system and we need to transform them to the local 3D Cartesian coordinates. And then after that, in order to make a 3D model, we need to measure an object from multiple positions or so-called scanner stations. And then we need to transform all of these measurements into single unique local coordinate system of choice, which is called registration. And after we are done with the registration, we need to transform this unique local coordinate system into the global one. Uh, and this process is called georeferencing. And as you remember, uh, this process is typically done in a way that with the laser scanner, we are observing targets where we can detect the center of the target very well. And then we are using special adapters that we can remove these targets, put GNSS antennas and estimate directly the central points of these targets in the global system and we are estimating the transformation parameters between local and global system which are typically just six uh, parameters three translations three rotations and to summarize this whole workflow you can see it on this slide uh, so what happens in the end is that each point in the point cloud measured with the TLS needs to pass the same transformation procedure from step one to step four uh, uh, to get the official coordinates of the state. So similarly, like we did with the GNSS observations. And this is it from me for today. Uh, these are again my references and I would recommend you to take a closer look if you are interested to find more about the surveying or geodetic engineering practices. And uh, thank you for the attention and I hope I will see you soon. Bye.